big congratulations to our award recipients here today and also celebrating in person next week in DC. And a big welcome to all of you to our now annual awards uh, reception that the Children's Environmental Health Network pulls together. We felt it's really important to have a panel discussion. And I mean, you know, receiving an award usually doesn't give you enough time, <laughs> adequate time to really engage and engage with each other. And we really feel, although I know none of our panelists do this just for the accolades by any means, this is part of our, our daily collective lives and our passions uh, to doing this work. But we do feel it's really important to stop and take a moment of, of show gratitude for our leaders out here in various sectors and disciplines that so continuously support the field that an advocate organization like the Children's Environmental Health Network must rely on to move in any direction, to uplift the live, life stories that communities are facing each and every day, and of course, to be a beacon for our, our youth and our children and, and to learn from them uh, as well and to listen. So I'm going to help us just navigate through the next hour or so, and I'm going to briefly introduce, it is not an adequate introduction, <laughs> of all of our amazing esteemed panelists, and then they will each start with about five minutes of just introductory comments of whatever they would like to say with the backdrop of the world we're living in today, and then we're going to have an engagement. Uh, so as Christy said, if you have some ideas and thoughts and questions, please do post them. We also have some of our own, but I'm going to start with Dr. Brenda Eskenazi, who is our, our Child Health Advocate in Science Award for 2023. She's Professor Emeritus at UC Berkeley School of Public Health and Director for the Center of Environmental Health and Community Health. She has worked locally and globally on the effects of environmental exposures on the health of children. She's interested in environmental exposures ranging from chemical exposure, such as pesticides and dioxins, to air pollution, to climate change, and studies how these environmental exposures may interact with social adversities to affect the development of all children, especially the most marginalized. And I've had the pleasure of meeting Brenda very early on in my career at CEHN, and she has, she and her research and her colleagues have been tremendous stewards and foundations to my growth uh, and advancement as well in this field. Christina Marusik is going to uh, also receive our Child Health Advocate in Arts and Media, and she's an award-winning journalist for Environmental Health News, an investigative reporter who covers environmental health and justice issues in Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania. Christina is also the author of her new book, A New War on Cancer, The Unlikely Heroes Revolutionizing Prevention, which uncovers an emerging national movement to prevent cancer by reducing our exposure to cancer-causing chemicals in our everyday lives. And I've had the pleasure of meeting and working with Christina as she developed her book, but also just seeing how she has used her amazing platform to truly be an incredible advocate for all of us in the field. Manu Antiru is our esteemed now um, in Seydu Obit Weatherspoon Youth Leadership Award recipient this year. He's an American Youth Policy Forum Youth Policy Consultant, a senior at Dartmouth College, and the co-founder of Project Misled, which lifts up youth voices to warn uh, through local public education campaigns about the dangers of lead and other heavy metals in drinking water. And Nathaniel Smith is the, uh, is the uh, excuse me, founder and CEO, and that's Chief Equity Officer uh, for the Partnership for Southern Equity. A, Southern of, a child of Southern Freedom Movement activist, Nathaniel works to advance racial equity through an equity agenda, which advances just outcomes that are sensitive to the needs and the circumstances of communities, working to erase the barriers that stand in the way of successes to create the conditions that enable just and fair inclusion into a society in which all people can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. And they're also hosting the Southern U Unity for Racial Justice and Equity Summit for the first time out of the Atlanta area in Memphis, Tennessee, otherwise known as Surge later this week. And Myself and other colleagues at CHN look, look uh, very much forward to attending. And then finally, we also have Danelle, Wel Danelle Wilkins, who's our Child Health Community Advocate Award, who's the CEO of the Green Door Initiative, which is a nonprofit organization promoting environmental justice in Michigan. For over 20 years, Danelle has had local movements, has led local mo movements for environmental justice, played a key role in developing the Michigan's environmental justice policy, has launched the city's first green jobs training program, 
has advocated for citizen involvement in public policies and citizen science and place environmental stewardship on the agenda of community leaders and decision makers. And she was named recently an innovator with the campaign for black male achievement. So again, we could say a lot more. I just want to give you a little bit <laughs> and we'll start with uh, Brenda, please, with your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Anse, for the introduction. And thank you very much to CEHN for the award. I'm very honored. I want to congratulate all of the other awardees as well. Um, I was asked to talk about how my work related to children's environmental health. Well, I think I need to start at the very beginning. In the 1970s, when I started uh, in the field, it really hardly existed. Um, I was originally trained as a neuropsychologist and I asked a question uh, to my advisor. If drugs can affect the behavior and development and well being of a child, what about low level chemical exposure, chronically exposed children? What, what are the effects of those chemicals? And at the time, the field really didn't exist. Herb Needleman's paper on lead came out in 1979, a landmark paper that kind of changed the field and got many of us to really really rethinking the importance of chemicals in the environment. Um, since then, the field has grown and the number of researchers and advocates has absolutely mushroomed. This is heartening, but we know that a huge amount of work needs to be done as new chemicals and other environmental factors such as climate change are being introduced or becoming more apparent. One more thing, as a neuropsychologist originally trained in that way, is that I am equally trained in the biology and the psyche, if you will. The, and so what I really think is important is for us to think not only of the physical health of children, but the mental health of children and how these are so interrelated. So for example, when we think of environmental disasters that have happened in the world, I, I could think back to the first environmental disaster that I studied, which was Three Mile Island, and that the main effects there were not the physical effects, but the mental health effects and the implications that had for the physical health and how these things are so interwoven and we can't really separate them. The other thing is for, this, for similar reasons, why we can separate out the social stressors from the physical stressors. They interact, they augment each other, and we need to be sure that we keep a mind on both those things, as well as nutritional factors when we're studying the health of children in relationship to environmental health. The thing that has become more, uh, we become more aware of is that we live in swimming pools of chemical exposures. Up until now, our field has looked at chemical by chemical by chemical, but really we're exposed to a multitude of chemicals. And how do those chemicals work together and work together with the social factors to affect the health of our children? So these are some of the things that we are at my Center for Children's Environmental Health, what we're trying to look at, but we're limited by what abilities we have to measure these chemicals in our, our bodies, in the environment, and also being able to understand all of the factors that interplay on the health of our children. So with that, I'll let the next person speak. Thank you, Brenda, um, your whole life history and professional career. And I would also add, I had the pleasure of, of connecting with Brenda for the first time in a while in Norway uh, last summer for the International Society for Children's Health and the Environment Conference. And it was really nice to again, once again, spend time. And, and Brenda was recalling many times in her professional career where as a woman in this field, uh, it was, you could speak better than I, but you know, the type of doors that she has also opened, she's being very humble for other female re, uh, oriented researchers to come uh, behind her and with her now and to continue to, to carry that mantle is extremely powerful. So um, we all applaud you and thank you for that. Christina, please. Thank you, Ense. Um, I came to this work um, like so many of us do through my own 
personal experience. Um, when my younger sister was 25 years old, she was diagnosed with thyroid cancer, which is um, not, uh, she wasn't a child, it wasn't a childhood cancer, but it is very young uh, in the young adult category for a cancer diagnosis. Um, we're two years apart in age and we're very close. Um, and that was really scary. Um, at the time, her doctors told us that uh, thyroid cancer usually runs in families, but no one else in our family has ever had it. Um, and they kind of mentioned, uh, oh, in that case, maybe she was exposed to something in the environment that may have increased her cancer risk. Um, but they didn't, they weren't able to give us any more information than that. They really didn't know what to say when we had follow up questions. When we kind of went Googling, um, we had a really hard time finding clear information about um, what that environment environmental health risks for something like thyroid cancer even were. Um, and I'm, I'm an investigative reporter, so um, I did the natural thing and decided to dig into this a little more through my work. Um, my sister is fine, I should say. She had her thyroid removed and underwent treatment and has been in remission for a decade. Um, she lives close by and has two super cute kids who I get to hang out with all the time, which I'm so incredibly grateful for. Um, but after that happened, um, I was still thinking about uh, her diagnosis and our experience and those questions um, when I started working for Environmental Health News as an investigative reporter, um, mainly covering Pittsburgh in Western Pennsylvania, which is where my sister and I both live. Um, and I did, I wrote a five part series on cancer and environmental exposures um, that looked at some uh, of the types of cancer that Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania have disproportionately high rates of, and their ties to um, our legacy and ongoing problems with industrial pollution. And that series um, won a couple of awards. I got a lovely note from a publisher asking if I'd be interested in expanding that into a book with a national focus. Um, and this is that book that came out in May, A New War on Cancer. Um, I. Uh, I'm so honored to get this award. I, in this book, um, I write, I spent a lot of time writing about problems. Uh, that's kind of the nature of being a journalist. So um, when it comes to children's health, I've written pretty extensively about um, lead pipes and water contamination and um, air pollution and childhood asthma. And um, it's really good for my mental health <laughs> and I think improves my reporting when I'm able to focus on solutions and uh, tell the stories of people who are uh, advocating for and finding meaningful solutions to these challenges, in addition to you know, focusing on the kind of gravity of the problems. And so my book is very focused on um, the heroes who are leading this work, including uh, Ense is one of the people who's profiled in my book, um, but I also consider um, my fellow panelists and awardees um, to be you know, the real heroes here who are doing this advocacy work. And um, I just am lucky enough to get to help tell their stories. So I'm really honored to be here with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you for Christina for reminding all of us that none of us are removed from being just one step of connection. I remember starting in this field after grad school 23, almost 24 years ago and asthma, childhood asthma was the thing at the time. And then it was childhood obesity, like these ranges of where the funding goes and the attention. And the reality is we used to say, you know, everyone knows someone with a child with asthma, if not has one in their home. And now it's sadly, we also know someone with some form of cancer or two or three, or it's us. Uh, and that those are not the trends. That's not the trajectory we are trying to go. And thank you for continuing to remind us and using your platform that there are solutions that are happening on the ground right now that need a magnifying glass, that need more attention, that need more capacity, but it's not like we're just reinventing the wheel at this point. So thank you for that. And Manu, please. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Manu Antiru. I am currently a senior at Dartmouth College where I'm uh, studying environmental biology and global health and engineering. Um, and my interest in environmental health sort of stems from a lot of learning I did throughout middle and high school, where I realized how foundational these different exposures can be in dictating not only your childhood health, but, you know, your health trajectory for the rest of your life. Um, and, you know, sort of the lack of attention and funding it can get considering how 
foundational it is to determining how healthy you are um, immediately and later on. Um, so in the past, in high school, I was a co-founder of an organization titled Project Misled that basically harnessed community power um, and trained different youth advocates around different states to teach their community members about really specific issues related to lead and heavy metal poisoning and exposure. Um, and that work was really meaningful because it was the first time that I had sort of engaged in on the ground community organization. Um, and from there, I realized that I was quite interested in a lot of the scientific side of things. So my work at Dartmouth is centered around an environmental epidemiology lab with Professor Megan Romano. Um, and that's focused on PFAS um, and different modes of exposure from supplements to water to vegetables and the ways in which they impact not only youth, but also prenatal development and adults. Um, this is work that I'm really excited and really passionate about, and I'm so grateful for this award and also so grateful for the opportunity to meet so many folks who have been doing really foundational work for, for such a long time that have inspired me. Um, so thank you all for being here. Thank you. Uh, everyone should know not only an environmental epi student and engineering, also applying to medical school <laughs> and also a co-founder of you know this incredible organization, as you've heard. And thank you for reminding us about the importance of the social determinants of health and how it has an impact now and into the future and future generations, right? The last thing we need or want is zip codes to dictate uh, the health and well-being of our next generation of children. And also very much appreciate the experience and the work that you show so many of us about training different advocates, the power of training the trainer, if you will, and listening, and also that on the ground community advocacy. Really, really appreciate and uh, applaud you for your continued leadership. Nathaniel, please. What an honor uh, to have an opportunity to uh, participate in this conversation. You know, what an honor. Um, to receive this incredible award from CEHN and an organization that has worked so long to make sure that children were not just thought about, but are actually at the table, you know, when key decisions are made around health. And so I want to take a couple of seconds just to honor you and say, and, and, and the work that you are doing every day um, to move this forward, this work forward. And so for me, very similar to what Christina was saying about proximity. Um, um, for me, that is where my passion started actually being someone who lived in a community where it was easier to buy a honey bun and a head of lettuce, right? Um, to live in a community where my friends constantly had asthma attacks, you know, in school or walking on the way home because the air quality was so bad. Um, or, you know, seeing the, the young person with a, a diagnosed, uh, undiagnosed or wrongly diagnosed mental health challenges, you know, put away, you know, somewhere to be forgotten about as opposed to being supported and, and, and the trauma and, and, and violence um, that I saw as a young person and, and, and just the lack of opportunity um, encouraged my own passion for wanting to make a better world for all people. And we talked a great deal about the social determinants of health and, and what we're learning um, through my work at the Partnership of Southern Equity is that race is the social determinant of health for black folks and historically disinvested communities of color. And so we have to do the work of not just creating a, a level playing field as, a, as it pertains to spatial equity and, and understanding the social determinants of health and, and the effect, the spatial effects on those social determinants. We also have to understand how racism uh, continues to play a role in harming our children of color, um, in particular Black children and historically disinvested children of color. Um, and so for us at the Partnership of Southern Equity, the work is not just around um, facilitating change in ways that happen to young people, but remembering the past, because the past in many ways is the present, and understanding the role that young people played in the Southern Freedom Movement, or what some people call the Civil Rights Movement, and really moving policy and systems in ways that realize what Dr. King called a values revolution, that you, know, you can't really create the type of policy changes that we want without young people lead, helping to lead that work. Um, and so for us, 
we've been very intentional. Although we're a multi-issue organization, we've been very intentional about engaging young people as leaders around the issues that we care about. And in particular around health, the work that our Yes for Equity team, our Youth Empowered Solutions team, um, which consists of about 17 young leaders um, from around the Southeast who are working with us every day to advance a policy agenda around racial equity and health. And we've just been honored to have an opportunity to work and engage with them around these issues. So from our young people being involved in the redesign of our metropolitan transit system, you know, through surveying and through active advocacy around the redesign, um, partnering with uh, other organizations to engage young people at various events, um, to the work that we've had a chance to do in Mississippi um, around tobacco um, and really advocating for tobacco-free school policy, a statewide policy in Mississippi um, through the Caffey Caffey Public Health Foundation and other key partners that are helping us move that work. Um, to the work that we're doing around the Bipartisan Safe Community School Act that just passed in uh, July 2020, where we're working in four states now, South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, and North Carolina, to engage young people um, around advocating for an adequate funding of that and also educating the broader community about the Safe Schools Act. And then last but certainly not least, we recently partnered with the Bezos Earth Fund now um, to do uh, youth leaders for equity programming around uh, greener communities and allowing young people to actually be involved in that effort um, that we call the Thriving Urban Green Initiative. You know, really teaching young people about the importance of green infrastructure and why they need to be involved in that work. So for us, it's just really important to make sure that we are preparing the next generation of leaders and for older leaders that have been in this work, our primary responsibility should be putting ourselves out of a job. And, and, and if it's really about removing us from those jobs, we need to make sure that we have young people in place that, that are not only with us, but in a in a position to lead. And so um, again, thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Nathaniel, reminding us race is the social determinant for communities, all communities of color. Children are not just need to be talked about, but we honestly need to have them at our table in the just few examples. I know you have many more of ways that Partnership for Southern Equity is, is taking a step back and allowing our next, our younger people, our next generations to take the type of leadership roles that they are born for. And uh, you know, remembering that the past is a vital for our future, our future pathway forward. So just appreciate all of those very important reminders as we frame uh, this conversation and the needs for all of us moving forward. And Danelle. Thank you, thank you, Insay. Thank you, um, everyone else. Your work is pretty amazing, and I'm really happy to be among um, this cohort of honorees uh, and the opportunity to share today some of my work. I will make a little bit of a um, suggestion uh, about my uh, bio. It's outdated because I've been out here doing this more than 20 years. <laughs> more like 32 years uh, being part of the, uh, the First People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit that created the 17 Principles of Environmental Justice and really launched the formal movement for environmental justice at that time. And it really, like Nathaniel said, uh, for young people, it really gave me um, purpose and an idea about what I would do and how I would dedicate my life. And so I've been fortunate to be able to work in this space uh, all that time. And, uh, and, and I'm looking forward to helping to pass the baton. Uh, there is a transition kind of effort underway, even at my organization, and uh, so that we get to the finish line, that we get to improve the quality of life uh, for everyone. So I'm one of those folks like you are, who happens to believe that everybody is entitled to drink safe water, to breathe clean air, to be in schools, 
where they're not exposed to uh, asthma triggers or lead poisoning uh, to be able to thrive and make it um, to the point where they that all can contribute to the quality of life we all deserve to have as human beings. And so uh, my work has really been centered around that. I'm located in the city of Detroit. I've, been, I've had the great fortune of working in my own hometown and across the country, and even having the ability to lift up an international voice with regard to climate justice and environmental justice and all those things. Um, so I want to uh, give honor to someone that keeps me focused and that's Xavier Joe. I met Xavier, well, let me say, I learned about Xavier in 2012. He happened to be 10 years old at the time. And I was listening to a, a newscast and the newscast was about this tragic uh, moment where the local emergency 911 and others were not able to make it in time to this house in Detroit. And uh, that happened to be where Xavier Joe lived. And Xavier had asthma. Xavier ran to his mom uh, on a uh, fall day like this actually, and said he couldn't breathe. Um, she tried to administer the medication on hand and it, it wasn't working. She called 911. Uh, she she lets neighbors know she needed uh, help getting him to the hospital. Um, like many people in this particular neighborhood, she did not have access to a uh, personal automobile. And uh, it may be a surprise to many, but in Detroit, public transit is not that great. So she had no way to get her baby to the hospital. He slipped away in her arms in the driveway. And when I heard that, of course, the headline was 911 didn't get there in time. But for me, it was why did this, this little one die so soon? And I learned that he had asthma. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. This is a preventable disease. This is a, uh, an issue that we've been grappling, grappling with far too long. And yes, it's a tragedy deal that 911 and emergency folks didn't show up. But more importantly, why could he not, why was it that he was not able to breathe? Uh, places like Detroit are disproportionately impacted by poor air quality. A lot of that came out during the pandemic when we understood that people of color communities across this country were suffering and dying due to COVID more than anybody else. And that's because their lung capacity and air quality was pretty compromised. And so add on, you know, a pandemic, and then you have a really bad outcome. And so my work has been, as I think about Xavier, that keeps me focused, like it's not done yet. Until every child, everybody is able to breathe. Uh, it's not, the work is not done yet. So we have been, we're, we're pretty focused on solutions. Our mission is to ensure that everyone is environmentally literate, capable of promoting and living out a sustainable lifestyle, irrespective of income, irrespective of zip code, and of race. Every child, when they enter into this earthly world, has the right to be treated like any other human being. And so our work has been focused on advocacy, promoting public health, doing whatever we can locally or whatever to make sure that people uh, who are in a position to make a difference, uh, make decisions or whatever, are doing the right thing. In the meantime, we have a program here called the Air Quality Management Project, and it's intended to um, identify uh, early childhood uh, facilities, daycare facilities, and others um, to do assessments of their facilities, looking at indoor and uh, ambient air, outdoor air quality, uh, placing uh, and installing, um, um, I'm sorry for all the ums, placing and installing monitors and, and other things that provide real-time information on air quality. So uh, that we can figure out ways in these local local facilities to mitigate, reduce those impacts, 
and uh, at least start as young as we possibly can, uh, trying to link resources to these facilities so that they can do all that they can to reduce any kind of triggers or whatever. But we're working on issues around lead poisoning, anything we can do um, to improve the quality of life for folks in our community. Um, I often say um, we can't afford to wait on the cavalry. They're not coming. Whether the cavalry is the government or whomever, they're not coming. What we need is to be in that position of leadership, uh, making certain our voices are heard, getting in front of visions that can transform and translate uh, into livable communities and do whatever we can to get people who have our best interests uh, at heart in positions of decision making. Um, so that's all that I have to say at this very, uh, at the top of, of the conversation. And I look forward to the conversation going forward. Thank you. Thank you and 30 plus years <laughs> and then some, and I agree, we've talked often about the last thing any of us want is to have our organizations, our efforts uh, be so dependent that we have to be here. Actually our related concerns and missions and I'd say vital foundation of work should be, it needs to be a natural implementation of said policy, said public health standing, uh, research agendas and on and on, right? Um, and, and thank you as, as you always do in such an eloquent way of, of demonstrating the art of storytelling. You know, bringing Xavier into this space, um, unfortunately, we could all come with hundreds, if not thousands of examples, whether it's personal, professional, and or our networks and colleagues lifting up child after child after child, who again, had nothing to do with the circumstances that they are finding themselves in, and yet have the biggest burdens between our climate crisis, between our environmental threats uh, to their breathing, living, walking, drinking, and uh, eating, just to name a few exposure pathways um, as they try to make a way. So you all, that was just the intro. <laughs> Um, and you're already getting all kinds of love and kudos here on the side chat and inspiration and, and all of that, which is also a big part of this. But let's dig in here. And uh, again, this is quite informal. We encourage those of you listening, please start chatting in some questions. We've got some here. Our colleagues here also know we might just form our own conversation as we move forward, but uh, it's definitely all good. So each of you works towards improving children's environmental health and health equity through different approaches, whether that's through research, community engagement, journalism, advocacy, policy development, youth leadership empowerment, and many of the many ways that you've just uh, told us about in your intro comments. And you come to this work from diverse backgrounds as well. So given your unique experiences and expertise, how do you feel the confluence of today's significant intersectional issues such as the COVID pandemic that's still very much here and other future viruses that will certainly plague our regular ability to just go out and live our lives, uh, climate change crisis, environmental racism, we could go on and on. In your mind, how are they affecting children's environmental health today, the end, the last quarter of 2023, and what are the projected needs and continuing challenges uh, beyond what you've already raised? Anyone want to jump in? <laughs> I don't mind starting uh, to answer this question. For me, it's always been about influencing and impacting policy. Uh, that as long as there are policies that disproportionately enable um, the exposures and the dangers of uh, the issues we see, uh, we're going. We're not going to be able to get up all out of these issues. For example, one of the policies that I find uh, really interesting is around transportation. Uh, but this one is around highway and freeway transportation. Like a number, because of previous um, discriminatory housing practices and stuff, a number of the communities I serve and work with are people who live in direct um, you know, having direct exposure to mobile sources of uh, pollution and that kind of thing. And what I've learned is that in the state of Michigan, at least, that um, there are uh, infrastructure uh, investments that can be made to reduce those impacts. And one of them is creating 
walls along the freeway that puts a barrier between, you know, residents and mobile sources, maybe investing in landscape and whatever. And I learned that that's triggered when the housing, um, when property uh, values are of a certain level. That's when you get those protective factors in. And that's a problem because certain areas will never meet that standard. That's a policy. That's policy implications that if change could reduce uh, the number of children who are exposed to those mobile sources in their school buildings, in their homes, and wherever. But if you pay attention to where you see real nice um, barriers um, for, for improving air quality, you'll notice what type, who lives there, what level of uh, income they bring to the table, what kinds of property values there are. And then you'll see they get the benefit from those policies. So policy, uh, informing policy, being able to uh, uh, impact policy, uh, for me, is one of those strategies that we haven't taken as full advantage of because we have to dig so deeply to find where they are. So I'll, I'll, I'll put that out there. Thank you. Brenda, please. So I agree that we have to impact policy, but I think after 40 years of being in this field, we've done a really good job, but not enough. And I would like to go back to something that Nathaniel said and what he's focusing on, which is the youth and the next generation of leaders. It's very important for us in our work is to educate children and to educate the teachers that teach those children about environmental health threats. Um, there was a wave in our field of educating the providers, which I still think is important but it's the children that actually really make the difference. We all probably, well, some of us that are old enough remember that it was the kids that reminded their parents to put their seatbelts on that actually use the seatbelts. We in our center and search have made a major focus of our work is to make use in our community, which is a farm worker community. We're working with low income Latino families we engage youth to become researchers and to learn firsthand about the environmental health issues in their community. We have found that they become the policy makers. We've had them go to Sacramento, our state, and people listen to children when they come to them. They don't listen in general, but when a child says, my community is being polluted and I can't breathe, or my community doesn't have, has food deserts. They do listen. And so I agree with Nathaniel. We need to educate the next generation of leaders. We need to bring the youth into our research as researchers um, and also as advocates. And one way to do that is to go to the schools and to bring the schools in and the school districts in to learning about what we do. And say, may, may I? May I? Thank you, Brenda. Yep. Thank you. And thank you, Miss Brenda, Miss Wilkins. I, you know, I, I want to elevate the conversation a little bit higher because I think um, policy is really important. And, and again, I'm, I'm definitely honored to receive the policy award. Um, but transformational policy won't happen without a values revolution. And, and, and until we begin to focus on shaping the values of our society in understanding that policy is just a reflection of the values of people in power, um, that we won't be able to move the agenda that we need to move for our communities. Until Black children are considered just as valuable as white children in our society, is it, until we begin to understand that the communities that are coming out the 
areas that are being disinvested in and harmed by pollution are actually our future workforce and, and the future communities that we need in order to move forward collectively as a community. Until we continue to allow a certain segment of our communities to define the people that we love and care about as liabilities and not assets to our community. Um, we're going to continue to have the challenges that we're facing. And so, you know, I think it's very important for us to have the facts. I think it's very important for us to advance policy. But until we shift the values that undergird um, the, the policies that are being passed, um, we're not going to be able to move the transformational agenda that we want to realize. And that is why it is so important for us to engage young people. Um, because in many ways, they play a role in shifting the values of a society. Um, and, and also, many of the communities that are being left behind are really the cultural shapers of our community as well. All you have to do is look at popular culture to understand that. So what is, what is the work that is required for us to win and not just be right? Um, because, you know, a lot of us are, feel like we're right, but it doesn't mean automatically we're going to win. And I think we need to focus on doing the things that will allow us to win in a moral way and in a way that's consistent with our values, but also understand that in order for us to be successful, there has to be a component of this work that is focused on realizing a values revolution, because if we're not focused on that, then we won't be able to realize the policies that we want to happen um, in ways that will support our communities, the communities in particular that we care about. Thank you, a values revolution. I mean, you know, wet behind the ears coming out of grad school, I just couldn't even understand why there was an organization needed uh, in 2000 that would focus on the protection of all children and then quickly <laughs> realize, I mean, you look at our education system, our healthcare system, and we could go on and on. Many of us say this, we have never lived in our lifetime in a system that ever put the vulnerability of people and certainly our children first and their needs. And how, how refreshing would it be for us to turn this on its head and talk about that moral revolution, that type of true revolution that changes how the traditional thinking has and continue to have. And you're right, the policy making process has been very traditional, very rigid. And, and I will acknowledge our states. Our states have been much more proactive, progressive, our cities, and it needs to perpetuate to the federal level as well. Um, and Manu, I wanna get you in and Christina, and, and I also wanna engage uh, one of our uh, questions that came in from our viewers, which also gets into this realm, says politics right now are so deeply divided and so many politicians are not paying attention to the science and the people most affected as we're talking about today. How do we keep moving forward on protecting our most precious resource, our children from mm -hmm. environmental health threats with that type of polarization? And many would say, this is not the first time <laughs> we've lived through conflict or, you know, but I will say this field is what, in my opinion, but I think very realistically, one of the most non-controversial <laughs> issues. And yet to the point you're all raising, we get to the line of discussion. We're having lots of discussions and we're doing better, better, but we have a lot more to do of getting youth voices at the table. And quite frankly, they're passing us and leading in their own voice. And yet the actions still are so behind where they need to be. Manu, I would love uh, any thoughts that you have on, you know, with the backdrop of where we're living, and I'm sure what you're hearing, I have a son in college as well, on college campuses, disenfranchised, my frustration, you know, anger may be justified, would, would love to bring your voice into this conversation also. Yeah, of course. Um, I think that everything that you said and what everything is, what everyone has said today so far, I've really resonated with. Um, and especially coming at it as a perspective as someone younger entering the field, I think I've seen so many of my peers see this as not only an issue that impacts the next generation, but that impacts us. Um, so I think that there's a really deep desire and a deep drive to do substantive work in so many of these different realms, right? Um, and that's been really inspiring to me, at least, because 
you know, I think initially when you think about environmental health work, you may just think about, you know, the medical or the research elements of it, but it's really so interdimensional, whether you're doing policy related work or you're advocating for people of different socioeconomic backgrounds. I think that there's there's so much connected to it that so many young people now are feeling so inspired and, and connected to doing. Um, so at least personally, it makes me, you know, really motivated and really excited to see the future of the field, um, because I can only imagine it moving in a direction where more people are becoming engaged and aware. Um, but hopefully, you know, it'll it'll be on the back of the work that everyone here has already done in so many different disciplines. Thank you. And Christina, whether you want to respond to that one and or this this next uh, question about what can everyday people do? All right. A lot of times when we're talking about climate, we're talking about air, it's you know, water. <laughs> These are our agricultural system to the average person. That's very overwhelming, right? I'm trying to put food on the table. I'm trying to pay for childcare. Nonetheless, think about the air quality of that childcare. And I hope that I'm not unknowingly putting my child in harm's way. I'm trying to just get the groceries in the door. Nonetheless, worrying about am I feeding them something, even though I'm washing them well, that could cause harm to their brain and neurodevelopment and future reproductive system. I mean, it's a lot of pressure out here um, just on the day to day. So Christina, just starting with you, I know you've spoken with a lot of folks for your um, a fantastic book and you've continued to hear these stories. Uh, what might you let start to lift up as far as what the average person out here could, could think about doing to be part of the solutions? Thanks, Ense. Um, you know, I've really tried to, I'm doing a lot of interviews about um, these topics with kind of, um, with like very, mainstream kind of broadcast TV stations and podcasts right now. And um, people really like their first impulse when they learn that, you know, the world is not as safe as they maybe once thought it was, hoped it was, particularly for their children. The first impulse is, um, well, what can I, you know, what product should I be buying? How do I buy safe products? How do I filter the air in my home? How do I filter my water um, to protect my family right now? And those are, um, of course, that's our first impulse. And I try to um, make sure that I, I have a couple of resources to point people toward, um, but also say, uh, make sure to make the point that it is just fundamentally not fair to ask parents to become experts in this and uh, become really meticulous consumers and read every single label and um, learn how to filter the air in their homes. And that um, there's a parallel here with um, the way we can end it as individuals um, address the climate crisis and deal and address the plastics crisis. It's not by becoming perfect recyclers or minimizing our personal carbon footprint, right? It's about taking that energy, that um, that limited amount of energy we've all been told we have and that we've all been kind of uh, duped into turning inward and turning it toward uh, avenues to, for systemic change. Um, so instead of becoming a kind of obsessive consumer, obsessive recycler, uh, obsessed with their own carbon footprint, it's really about uh, taking that same energy and uh, finding ways to get involved with existing movements that are pushing for systemic change instead, um, which is, of course, what what all of you are doing. Um, and I think in terms of, you know, I'm doing my approach to all of this is a little different because I'm not doing direct advocacy work, um, doing journalism. Um, but I think, um, you know, part of that is for, I'm very lucky to work for a publication that says um, we're not biased by being on the side of human health and by advocating for children's health. Um, there's not really a two sides to this debate. Um, and we're not afraid to uh, write stories and do journalism that reflects values that are in favor of human health and preserving the planet and preserving human health. Um, and I hope that we see, you know, more uh, news outlets kind of coming around to that place and um, doing journalism that is reflective of those values we all share instead of um, beholden to a kind of like pretend uh, two-sidedness to issues related to human health and children's health. Thank you, Christina. So I know we're rounding out here uh, wondering in the spirit of uh, not overwhelming folks with these very deep, important issues and giving inspiration as we kind of wrap up this discussion. 
I, we already, you all have already have lifted up some incredible programs you know of that you're a part of. What are some other successes as you would call it, right? We haven't got this all figured out, but we do know the magnitude of order does make a difference. Us working by ourselves is not gonna get, us all working together towards the same direction of a system, a political system, education system, mental health system, that again, considers the most vulnerable is a natural protection for every single one of us. Please, maybe we could do a round here. I would encourage you to lift up at least one program, solution-oriented effort that you believe is going in the right direction and is truly making a difference in the lives of children. I know you have a bunch, so who'd like to start? <laughs> I have one off the top of my head that, um, so I wrote about them pretty extensively in the book. It's the Cancer Free Economy Network. Um, they're really geared toward big, big, big systems level change um, to try and make sure we're all exposed to fewer cancer causing chemicals in our everyday lives. Thank you so much. Um, I, 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 I will lift up an initiative that, that was actually started with the support of the Kresge Foundation called CCHE, um, Climate Change and Health Equity Initiative. And, and they've been funding a lot of great organizations around the country to really work at the intersection of health equity and climate issues on the ground um, in communities. And um, they've been able to do some really, really um, good work in Atlanta um, in partnership with us, but in other places too around the country. And I think really bringing it as close to the ground as possible and also kind of working at the intersection of climate and health, which is very similar to what you all do here and funding it, right, is is has really helped to facilitate some real changes in, in some communities. And so I would definitely encourage people to, to, to learn about the CCHE initiative of the Kresge Foundation. Thank you so much. Where are some others? And thank you for bringing in the philanthropic community, which is also vital to our collective success. I can give a, a small example in our community. As I said earlier, we work presently with uh, farm worker families in the agricultural Salinas Valley in the Tramaco study. And I was speaking to a grower representative recently. And in our community, up until recently, about 4% of crops were grown organically. It is now 25% of the crops are grown organically. And the reason being is twofold, in my opinion. One, those consumers who can afford organic are demanding more organic. I'm not saying that we should all buy organic because food, most importantly, to eat right. Um, the second reason is because the state of California has really made a huge effort for using integrative pest management to manage pests. And because of that, there has been a pull away from using chemicals. I hope this trend increases in the future because it means that not only our kids who don't live near agricultural fields, but the kids who live right near agricultural fields will have less exposure to, to pesticides. So I think that is a big change. Thank you, Brenda. I think that's a great, Danelle, yes, definitely going to get to you. I think that's a great that's example, for example, of some state policies that are making a difference. I'm sitting here in the state of Maryland that has been, has been one of many states that has integrated pest management policies around school uh, facilities. That's huge, right? Where kids spend a lot of time, their early learning childcare, their K through 12 schools, their homes, their future occupational settings. These are all vital settings to their exposure pathways. And by, there are some case examples, for example, in Indiana, by not spraying the unknown chemicals in a, a conglomerate of many schools in a school district, they were able to save money and then hire an integrated pest management coordinator who now is helping them continue to keep their athletic fields and their indoor environments much healthier and safe than before. And they're also seeing some co-benefits of less um, absenteeism, kids being healthier generally, not having other side effects from what was you know, known to be known pesticide sprayed for the history. Uh, and they're not the only school district. So there are definitely some economic success stories as well as health and justice success stories. But Danelle, I think you were gonna jump in. Yeah, I was just gonna offer up one uh, 
positive example uh, project is a community-based participatory re research project called Community Action to Promote Healthy Environments or the CAFE Project. And it's a collaborative between the University of Michigan Schools of Public Health and several community-based organizations um, and um, that the health department with the city and a number of, uh, of other sort of uh, entities. And the whole uh, focus of this particular research effort is to bring link policy to to, to the research and uh, utilize that approach in impacting changes at the local level. So one example of how this, this particular effort was effective was in the city of Detroit, there was a huge uh, petrochemical company wanting to expand and um, their mitigation approaches to reducing air uh, pollution just didn't line up with what works, what we know the science says works. And so uh, for the first time, the head of the health department actually went in to advocate to block their expansion. That's highly unheard of. And the mayor jumped in to do that as well. Now, typically entities like this, they promise jobs and other things um, to get people to accept whatever um, impacts that may, may occur. Well, it didn't work this time and they did not get that expansion. And so I think that kind of collaboration is key, bringing science, activism and uh, decision makers together to, to uh, influence those kind of decisions. Certainly, thank you so much. Again, we cannot do this by ourselves. We need to involve as many collective expertise, lived experiences as possible so that we do create that type of set of systems that, that are much different than where we've been functioning. And uh, Manu, please, maybe last word. Yeah, I think one organization that stood out to me, um, I guess not an organization, it's the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, but one program that they do is on well replacement, um, especially for families of lower income who have found chloride or PFAS in their water. Um, and working with them pretty directly over the past three years for my research, I realized how foundational those federal supports and state support systems can be in you know, getting people water that they need from private wells. Um, and it's just a reminder that you know, even though there can be a lot of red tape when you're working with the federal or state organizations, so much of their work is meant by and for the people and the people working in those organizations are just as motivated and committed as you know people in the private sector ngos to resolving a lot of those um different disparities certainly i want to thank you all so much and there's been some incredible thoughts here presented in the chat as well and acknowledgement that you know there's no state that's perfect uh we're all learning from each other here we're all trying to take advantage of not reinventing the wheel uh, I do want to put a plug in for Children's Environmental Health Day. Uh, this is Child Health Month. Now that we're in October, we started this day. Uh, it's every second Tuesday, uh, Thursday of October, which is October 12th this year. That is where in person we will be celebrating these amazing uh, award recipients. Uh, so if you're in the DC area, please come out and join us. This is a day for and with our youth to learn from each other and our partners. We're creating a platform so that any and all of your events, activities, tools, resources, Please go to the website. Please send us a note. We want to hear from you so we can magnif magnify the work you're doing because it really does work to model best practices and to network and learn from each other. With great appreciation to all of you, Christy and Hannah at CEHN and our entire team, we wish you all the best in your fall days to remain healthy, be careful out there. And we do encourage you to join our communication and let us know how we can help and support your work. <laughs>